Hello everyone, welcome to my latest Star Wars book review. Um, I apologize for looking like a bit of a beach bum right now, but I just got back from the pool and I'm a bit of a mess and I don't feel like changing. So uh, this is what you get and this is the only time I can film this video. So you'll just have to make do with what you got. Um, if my, sh my Hawaiian Baltimore Orioles shirt is an eyesore to you, I apologize in advance. Um, just, sh you know, Minimize the browser and just listen to the audio and you'll be just fine. But uh, yeah, let's get into my monthly Star Wars book review. Um, I've got a bit of a doozy this month and one that I've been wanting to do for a while. Uh, but before I get into that, let's talk about a few updates for the Star Wars book reviews. Um, as you know, for those of you who've been watching these videos, um, I do one a month. And I wanted to provide some updates on the next couple ones that are coming up. Um, Next month's is going to be X-Wing Part 1, where I uh, go over the Rogue Squadron portion of the X-Wing books. Uh, so that'll be that. So uh, hopefully that's something that interests you guys. And then after that, um, I am still making my way through the new Jedi Order series. As of right now, I am eight books into the 19 book series. So I think I have enough material to do, um, to do a follow-up video and to cover the next portion of uh, the, net, the New Jedi Order series. Um, for those of you who remember, I did, um, or for those of you who don't remember actually, I did uh, Vector Prime way back in January, and now it's time for me to go back and revisit uh, the New Jedi Order series, uh, covering possibly the next, next six or seven books in part two. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. That one will be either August, and if not August, it'll be September. I might have another one in August that I'm kind of toying around with, but we'll see if I get there. Um, so yeah, let's just get started with this month's review. Now, um, if you've watched my previous reviews, you know I've covered some books that I adore. I've covered books that uh, were really big to me as a child and ones that I really enjoyed. And I rank up there as some of the best Star Wars stories ever, movie, book, or otherwise. Uh, they're just really, really flipping good. Uh, the Thrawn trilogy definitely comes to mind. Um, and there's, uh, there's a high benchmark there for books like that. But then I've covered some not so good ones, like the Jedi Academy trilogy, and the Kalista trilogy, and the Crystal Star. So, Star Wars has had its share of downers as well, and I can say with full confidence that the books I'm covering today are quite possibly the worst Star Wars books ever written, and that is saying a lot when you see some of the books I've read uh, with the Star Wars banner on it. The Jedi Academy trilogy was a complete and utter mess. The Crystal Star was a boring, dull, lifeless mess. Uh, the Kalista Trilogy was annoying. But these books are like on a whole other plane of bad. These are absolutely terrible. The only thing that keeps me from saying that they are definitively the worst Star Wars books ever written is that they are so bad, they're hilarious. These things, they're not boring. They're sure, oh my God, they are sure as hell not boring. These books are so cartoonishly awful that they are some of the funniest things I've ever read, Star Wars or otherwise, and I can't believe these things were published. Um, they are fascinating, and they're so terrible that I often wonder if the authors, uh, uh, husband and wife team Paul and Hollis Davids, um, I often wonder if they were serious when they wrote it. Like, this almost felt like it was done on purpose, to be as hilariously wrong as possible. Um, these books are, uh, they were fairly common uh, among kids uh, back when they first came out, because these were intended to be young adult books. So these were targeted at a much younger audience, and they're super, super short. Like, um, I think the New Jedi Order book, uh, Star by Star, my copy of which is over 600 pages, I think that book is longer than, that, that one book in the New Jedi Order series is longer than the entire Jedi Prince series, all six books. Uh, these books are really, really short. Um, they're quick to get through. I no longer have physical copies of these books. I was able to find PDFs online to reread them uh, for the purposes of this review, but um, if you're able to get your hands on these or find PDFs or uh, if you've got old copies stashed away, I highly recommend going back and reading these things because they are absolutely hilarious. They are, if I had to compare it to anything, um, 
and this goes back into my line of thinking that the authors did this on purpose. It reminds me of my favorite YouTube video of all time. Saturday Morning Watchmen. I love that video. It's flipping great. It was clearly made by people who understood Watchmen inside and out, and then they produced something that was completely wrong. And that's why it's funny, because you can tell that the people that made it know Watchmen like the back of their hands, and they were able to make something so hilariously wrong that it's just one of the funniest things ever. This book series kind of has that feel to it, where... It, but again, I don't know if it was intentional or not, but I, I found it funny, so who the hell knows? Um, but it's just they get just about everything wrong, and it's hilarious. Um, God, I, even now, I, I don't even know where to start, but uh, I guess I could just go ahead and name the books. It's a six-part series, uh, starting with the first entry, The Glove of Darth Vader. Then it moves into The Lost City of the Jedi. Then Zorba the Hutt's Revenge. Oh boy, I can't wait to talk about Zorba. Um, then the fourth book is Mission to Mount Yoda. Then Queen of the Empire. And then the final book is Prophets of the Dark Side. Now, those titles sound pretty cool, right? It's like, oh, the Glove of Darth Vader. That sounds interesting. I wonder what that's about. Zorba the Hutt? What's Zorba the Hutt? Want to know more about this? Mission to Mount Yoda? There's a Mount Yoda? Um... Prophets of the Dark Side? Queen of the Empire? Who are they talking about? What's going on? Um, so the titles are really cool, and probably the best, the, the legitimately best aspect of these books is the cover art by Drew Struzan, who is famous for doing uh, many of the classic movie posters, including Star Wars and Indiana Jones and various others from the 1980s. And uh, he did the cover art for these books and many other Star Wars books, and his work was always top friggin' notch, and um, it's almost like, uh, you know, John Williams' music being a perfect marriage for Star Wars. Uh, Drew Struzan's uh, cover arts and movie posters, um, his artwork are another example of just the perfect marriage. I mean, he, him and Star Wars just, just go hand in hand. And these books are, honestly, the covers to these books are some of his best work. Uh, you look at the cover to The Glove of Darth Vader. Um, that could be a movie poster. Like, it's that good. Um, you look at the cover to Zorba the Hutt's Revenge, which took a ridiculous character design, and again, I'm going to get into Zorba, took a ridiculous character design and made it look good. Um, his cover art's amazing, and I can't put it over enough. It's one of the reasons I wish I still had hard, my hard copies of the books, because those covers were friggin' sweet. And... Um, yeah, I, I just want to really put over his work because they were just top-notch. But, yeah, the titles were really cool and the covers were really cool. And they're short, so they're quick reads. Um, so I think a lot of kids pick these things up. Uh, I don't know how well they sold or anything, but uh, I know a lot of kids I knew had these books because they were they were easily available and they looked cool, sounded cool. Also, it's Star Wars, so huzzah. And Star Wars books were all the rage in the 1990s. With, from the Thrawn trilogy onward, it was just uh, Star Wars, Star Wars, Star Wars in the literary sense. So, um, so these books were fairly common, and then you actually open them up and read them, and it's like you feel like you're being transported into a whole other world, and I don't mean the Star Wars galaxy. I feel like it, it almost doesn't feel like Star Wars. It's like this feels like a bad Star Wars knockoff or a Saturday morning cartoon version of Star Wars that is completely terrible and manages to somehow be worse than both the Ewoks cartoon and the Droids cartoon. Uh, maybe I'll get to reviewing the Ewoks and Droids cartoon one day. We'll see. Because uh, I've seen both shows in their entirety. Um, because why not? <laughs> uh, but anyway... Um, these books, uh, again, it's uh, post-Return of the Jedi. They take place, I believe, um, shortly after The Truce of Bakura, which is another book I want to review at, at some point. But it takes place shortly after that book, not long after the events of Return of the Jedi. And it's basically the Rebellion slash New Republic still dealing with the, uh, the remnants of the Empire. And some evil bad guy steps up to kind of bring the Empire back to glory and the rebels and the new alliance, or the new, um, the new Republic tries to stop them. And that was something that was done a lot in the expanding universe, so it doesn't really cover any new ground from there. But, uh, and again, sounds very basic, right? Sounds very like, you know, what sounds so bad? Uh, once you get into the finer details, that's when everything goes, oh my god, this is a fucking 
shit show. Uh, let's start with the classic characters. One of the major criticisms that fans have of these books are that uh, the characters are written completely wrong, the classic characters. Uh, Luke probably made out the best out of all of them, or at least the most unscathed. Uh, but then you, when you get into Han Solo and Leia, that's where everything really starts to come apart, at least for me. Princess Leia throughout the entire book series, and when I say the entire book series, I mean the entire book series, all six books. She spends more time worrying about her wedding to Han Solo and planning her wedding than literally anything else. Uh, Leia becomes a bit of a bridezilla. Uh, not, like a, not like a raging bitch or anything, but she's like really focused on her wedding. And I'm just sitting there like, okay, I'm not saying that Leia wouldn't want a nice wedding. I'm not saying she wouldn't be excited about marrying Han or anything like that. Uh, what I'm saying is that you have a war with the Imperial Remnant coming. You have a new government to help establish and help run. Why in the universe are you focusing so much of your attention on planning your wedding? When you know that Leia would be, her attention would be elsewhere. Because that's just, that's Leia. She, she grew up in this. She uh, was forged by it, molded by it. Uh, she was born in it. Uh, <laughs> uh, she, uh, I feel like she would kind of focus her priorities on the task at hand, which would be dealing with this new imperial contingent uh, that's on the rise. Uh, the fact that she focuses so much attention on her wedding and the fact that she focuses... Um, uh, she pays so little attention to what's going on in the main conflict of the story. That feels so unlike Princess Leia. And you can throw ac accusations of sexism or anything like that. I'm not going to go that far with it, but it ju it doesn't feel like Leia at all. And you want to talk about getting characters wrong. Let's talk about Han Solo, who spends most of the book series trying to avoid getting married to Leia, where he's like, eh, I don't really want to, because I'm a bachelor type, which, okay, that kind of makes sense. But then when you get into I just want to retire and have my own dream sky house. Dream sky house. Yes, his buddy Lando hooks him up with his own dream sky house. A space bachelor pad, if you will, at Cloud City. I didn't know that Lando was still in control of Cloud City. I assumed he no longer was based on the events of Empire Strikes Back. But be that as it may, uh, Lando's able to hook him up with his dream sky house. And Han is just going on and on about how much he wants that dream sky house. And I'm sitting there rereading this. Uh, when I was rereading this for the purpose of this review, I just couldn't help but go... The words dream sky house should never come out of Han Solo's mouth unless it's sarcastic. Like... Dream Sky House? What? What the fuck are you talking about? Uh, that's Han Solo. I mean, we can talk about how the Han Solo movie got Solo's character wrong and everything. It's like, dude, this it's got nothing on this book series. Uh, the fact that he cares so much about his goddamn bachelor pad. He's like, I just want to relax, take it easy, and retire to my Dream Sky House. Um, actual quote. <laughs> He even has a housewarming party at one point in the series. I'm not making this up. Han Solo throws a housewarming party at one point in the series. I am not lying to you. Um, these are things that happen. Um, and then you have the other side characters like the C-3PO's, R2-D2's, and the Chewbacca's. They have virtually nothing to do. They're just there because they're classic Star Wars characters and they're, they're just there to fill up the space. But really, a lot of the attention goes to the newer characters, uh, namely the protagonist of the series who shows up in book two, The Lost City of the Jedi, uh, Ken, who is, who is the protagonist, the new Luke, if you will. And it felt like, um, and this is something I've touched up on a little bit, but it felt like the expanded universe tried really hard to create a new Luke, um, and they often failed. Uh, you know, you have the Jedi Academy trilogy, which it introduced Kip Doran, who is an unlikable son of a bitch. Uh, and rereading the new Jedi Order series, I'm like, yep, he's still an unlikable son of a bitch. That didn't change at all. A uh, little bit more experience and a few more years did nothing to make him any more likable. But, uh, you know, there, there are always these attempts to create the new Star Wars protagonist, and Ken is one of those examples, and he becomes, he's, he's the last survivor of the lost city of the Jedi, and he's raised by his own personal droids, and he's the, the Jedi Prince, uh, 
hence the Jedi Prince series. He's the Jedi Prince, and he comes into the fold, uh, becomes a student of Luke's, and uh, helps in the conflict against this new Imperial contingent. Uh, now, who makes up this new Imperial contingent? Who are these new bad guys that we got? Because, you know, for any story to work, you got to have villains. you got to have that conflict. got to have them antagonists. And... Uh, before I go into specific detail about these characters and why they're so hilarious to me, um, uh, when I was I, I was talking over Star Wars books with a friend of mine, and he was telling me it's like, dude, I've read the worst Star Wars book ever, and, and the example he used was uh, the Crystal Star. Um, he's not completely wrong on that at all, as I talked about in my last review. Uh, and I said, dude, no, I've read the worst Star Wars books ever. And I said, the Jedi Prince series. And, like, and we kind of got into a mini argument about it. And he was like, well, what makes the Jedi Prince series so bad? And I was like, well, turns out Emperor Palpatine has a three-eyed son named Triclops. And then literally my friend was like, okay, you win. <laughs> he was literally like, okay, you fucking win. That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And I'm like, yeah, right, right, right. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so a, a lot of these new villains and their motivation is based on um, following the line of succession uh, of the bloodline of the Emperor. And uh, the main, I guess you could call him the main villain of the series, Trioculus, is a three-eyed mutant um, who says that he's the true son of Emperor Palpatine because Emperor Palpatine's son has a third eye. Um, he is revealed that he's lying. He's not really the son of Emperor Palpatine, but... Uh, Emperor Palpatine's son turns out to be a prisoner of the Empire named Triclops, who's locked away, driven crazy. And then it's later revealed that Triclops is the father of Ken. So Ken is the grandson of Emperor Palpatine and the true heir to the Empire. Um, sure. <laughs> sure, but anyway, uh, I want to focus a lot of attention on Trioculus, because he's really the main villain of the series. And he might be the most ineffective and awful villain in all of Star Wars. He is such a bumbling idiot that I cannot believe that this guy was put in charge of anything. He is laughably terrible. The only success he has is in the first book, he gets the glove of Darth Vader because it was prophesized by another one of the villains, uh, the, the dark side prophet Kadan, who is a bearded dwarf that served the Emperor and was his prophet. And he prophesied the Emperor's death, but the Emperor didn't listen to him. And we all know what happened in Return of the Jedi. Uh, but anyway, he prophesizes that the new leader of the, of the Empire will have the glove of Darth Vader as like a sign of power. And uh, the first book ends with him getting the glove of Darth Vader, which he also believes gives him special powers. It also takes his powers away from him, as it turns out, as the book uh, advances. Like, the D glove of Darth Vader has an adverse effect on him. So it's like, okay, so your one big success actually hurt you. Good job, buddy. And then the rest of the series, he just looks like a friggin' dope. Um, he gets frozen in carbonite by Zorba the Hutt because, you know, that's embarrassing. We gotta embarrass the villain, of course. And then he gets unfrozen from the carbonite, and um, another one of his motivations throughout the series is that he sees Princess Leia and he just falls in love with her. He just smitten by Princess Leia, and he wants to make her the queen of the empire. Uh, which leads us into book five, which was Queen of the Empire. And he wants to kidnap Princess Leia and force her to marry him and make him, uh, make her his queen of the Empire. Um, the good guys are able to rescue Princess Leia, get her out of there, and replace her with a replica droid that looks exactly like her, but it's a droid. Now, uh, this ends up being one of, probably the most hilarious moment in the entire series, where... Trioculus actually goes through with the wedding, not realizing that this is a fake Leia. He goes through with the wedding ceremony, and then the droid, being the Trojan horse that it is, has like uh, a death rays in its eyes, and <laughs> while they're at the altar, it shoots Trioculus right in the chest and fucking kills him! And keep in mind, this is book five, not book six, so the book six... Main villain's already dead, so it's like, okay, I feel like the series is done at this point. You're just wasting my time. But anyway, um, so he gets killed by a robot duplicate of Princess Leia. Leia couldn't even do it herself because she's too busy planning her wedding. So she couldn't be bothered to actually, you know, take down the bad guy or anything like that. No, no, no. We got to let the droid do that. We got to let the, the, the fake replica robot droid do that. 
And this moment is so hilarious to me because, um, like I said, these books are intended for a younger audience. They're intended for kids. Uh, they're young adult novels. That's all well and good, except, um, and, and they're written like they're for young adults, like uh, language-wise, vocabulary-wise, um, the prose, and again, the, the length of the books, they're very short. So it seems like they're for a much younger audience. Until you get to moments like this, where it's so shockingly violent, I can't believe they put it in a children's book. So it's like, I don't know what they're going for here, but whatever it is, it's funny. Uh, like, uh, probably the single most hilarious moment in any Star Wars book that I've ever read is that moment when Trioculus... Oh, and by the way, um, these books have uh, uh, illustrations. They have pictures. And yes, there is a picture depicting this. I am not making this up. Um, I actually found, let's see if I can pull it up. Do, do, do. There was a top 10 list that I found, um, and I'll put a link to it in the description. Here we go, the top 10 crappiest aspects from uh, Star Wars The Jedi Prince series. This was from the robotsvoice.com back in 2011. So. Uh, yeah, I'll post a link to that in the description because that'll give you a much briefer, much more, uh, you know, much more to the point uh, description of how bad these books really are and really highlight the really lousy aspects of these books. But uh, they highlight that moment too, and it's just so hilarious. But Trioculus, I mean, this is a bad guy that. I, I feel like Skeletor and Cobra Commander would look at him and feel sorry for him. That's how much of a joke this guy is. Because when you look at how successful the Empire was in the original movies, uh, especially when you look at Empire Strikes Back, and how even, you know, they hold the, they keep the rebels on their toes right up to the very end in Return of the Jedi, um, you know, Stor Stormtroopers with bad aim aside, uh, they're mostly very successful and uh, somewhat of a threat. Trioculus is not a threat at all. This guy is so hilariously incompetent that it's, I, I can't believe that he was put in charge of anything. Now, you could argue that he was Kadan's kind of puppet leader, um, and he was, was never fit to be the leader anyway, but even so, like, <laughs> like Jesus, he's terrible. Um, but goddamn, is he funny. Uh, he's really, really funny. Uh, long live Trioculus. Uh, the, the, not since Stephanie McMahon was put in charge of ECW has there been such a great leader to represent a once powerful brand and faction. Uh, but anyway, it's, uh, yeah, Trioculus is just one of the funniest things in any Star Wars book I've ever read, and especially his demise and how uh, Zorba the Hutt humiliates him and how everybody seems to humiliate him and how even his one big victory just flips on itself. Uh, he looks like a total dope. Uh, throughout the series, and he is he is delightful. He is simply delightful. Great stuff. But other villains include, uh, like I mentioned, there's Zorba the Hutt, who is Jabba the Hutt's father, who is a hut with dreadlocks and a beard. You heard me right. There is a hut in Star Wars that has dreadlocks and a beard. His name is Zorba. He's Jabba's daddy. And he comes in in book three, Zorba the Hutt's Revenge, and his plot is that he wants to kill Princess Leia for killing his son Jabba. It's like, okay, I'm on board with that. That's a fairly solid motivation. He goes to Cloud City and tricks Lando Calrissian into betting uh, the deed to Cloud City in a game of Sabacc, and he cheats using his own personal cards that have these um, markings on the back of the cards that only he can see because huts have special eyes. and. Uh, special things in their eyesight that they can use to see these special marks on the card. So he's able to swindle Lando out of Cloud City, which leaves Lando, for the remainder of the series, running his own amusement park, a space amusement park. That's where Lando ends up. He runs Disneyland, space Disneyland, even better. Um, and he was dumb enough to bet Cloud City in a Sabacc game against a very crooked individual. Uh, because he's Jabba the Hutt's daddy. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, so he does, I mean, he's a better villain. I mean, he's more successful than Trioculus, so I give him points for at least winning, but uh, he manages to freeze Trioculus and Carbonite. Uh, at one point, he fails, though, because he gets thrown into this Sarlacc pit, but he manages to get out of the Sarlacc pit because, as it stated, um, 
even, not even the Sarlacc could digest something as disgusting as a hut. So uh, Zorba's presence is felt throughout the series. Um, he's a rather hilarious character. Now, the Huts have a fairly regular presence in the EU. They become somewhat of their own faction. Um, but Zorba is particularly funny because, as I said, it's Jabba the Hutt's daddy, and he's got dreadlocks and a beard. But if you look at Drew Struzan's cover art for that book... Looks okay. It actually doesn't look as stupid as it sounds. So credit goes to Drew Struzan for making that character work. And then we have a couple of side characters. I already mentioned uh, Prophet Kadan, and there's also Grand Moff Hissa. His name is Hissa, like a, like a snake. A snake hisses. And he's got black eyes, and I think he has fangs, too. I, I'd have to go back and look at the il illustrations. But um, uh, the problem I have with these characters is that if you look at the, the officers in the Imperial ranks uh, from the original trilogy, um, I really like them as side characters because they feel completely believable in their roles because they're not Saturday morning cartoon villains. They are stuffy military types. And I think that's one of the reasons a lot of fans don't like General Hux uh, from this new series is that he is an over-the-top, bad guy. Like, I'm, I'm the villain of this picture, and I'm going to rant, rave, and scream like a bad guy. If you look at characters like Admiral Piet, and even Grand Moff Tarkin, played by the wonderful Peter Cushing, uh, these guys are very straight-laced, and it feels like they're just doing their jobs. Uh, they don't really have, like, this personal... Uh, you know, cartoonish, like, oh, we're going to destroy the rebels. Oh, yes, we're going to kill them. We had the Emperor for that. And we had uh, Darth Vader to be kind of like the otherworldly bad guy. Um, but the rest of the crew was fairly regular military personnel and guys that you would expect to see in, uh, you know, some kind of military rank. And uh, Admiral Piet, completely believable. Uh, uh, what's his name? The one from Return of the Jedi. Uh, Moff... Je uh, Moff Jejerod? Uh, I know I mispronounced that. I butchered that, and that's going to get left in the comment section. Um, he was supposed to have a bigger role in Return of the Jedi, actually, where he actually like feels bad for the Rebels. Um, I've seen those deleted scenes, but uh, he has that one scene with Vader in Return of the Jedi. Again, completely believable in his role. He's just a guy giving a progress report to Darth Vader and trying to explain to him. He's like, look, this, this station will be operational as planned. Yes, the impossible. I need more men. Uh, just... Uh, those guys are completely believable. Even Tarkin, who is the slimiest of them, um, feels like a guy that is using whatever tactics he can to get what he wants. Uh, like tricking Leia to give him the give him a location of the rebel base, not the one he was looking for, as it turned out. But <coughs> but strong arming her and threatening to blow up Alderaan, which he does anyway because he's a dick. Um, even him, he just feels like a straight-laced military guy with a lot of authority and very much a control freak that's like, everything will go as I, as I plan it and as I command it. Veda, release him, and all this other stuff. Uh, keep everybody in line. And even Grand Admiral Thrawn feels very much, with all his philosophical um, musings and his appreciation for art and all these other great character things that they built into that character, um, even he feels like a straight-up regular military guy. And then you got these bozos, uh, like Prophet Kadan, who's a bearded dwarf, and Grand Moff Hissa, who's got a snake face, and looks like a Saturday morning cartoon villain, and you cannot take these guys seriously. It's like, oh my god, these guys were put in charge of a military? Like, they, they run the day-to-day -day operations of the Empire? Oh dear god, they don't stand a chance, because these guys are so cartoonishly inept and silly. And uh, again, part of the joy of reading these books is like, I can't believe these characters are, even exist. They're... God, they're funny. God, they're so funny. But, uh, yeah, so you get a, a weak bunch of new characters. You get the old characters getting um, written horribly. You get all these other weird aspects, like I talked about, like moments where it gets shockingly violent. And it, it just, it, it is such a unique experience reading these books. Again, I, I'm going to give them an F grade because they are ludicrous in their execution, but they are really funny, and I recommend reading them at least once. And another aspect of these books, uh, 
that a lot of fans have criticized. The over excessive use of acronyms. That has come up a lot in describing these books. Um, now, I am a contractor. I work in cybersecurity. I work for the federal government. I follow NIST standards, which is nothing but acronyms. So I'm used to it, and especially rereading it. I'm like, what? What's wrong with acronyms? What do you got against acronyms? I, I, I deal with acronyms in my nine to five job. God, <laughs> what's the problem? But they, they, Literally everything has an acronym in these books. There are so many acronyms. And um, even Zorba, I, I think um, Zorba brings in Jabba's Will at one point, and even Jabba's Will has an acronym, which is absolutely just adorable. But let me see if I can find some of the names. I had some of them pulled up. Um, da, 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 da. Where are you, Wikipedia? Here we go. All right, we have DROPHACK, which is the Defense Research and Planetary Assistance Center. And we have the New Republic Spy Agency, the Senate Planetary Intelligence Network. They're SPIN. SPIN and DRAPAC. Um, so yeah, if you like alphabet soup in your Star Wars books, get ready for it, because there are a lot of friggin' acronyms in these, in these books. It's hilarious. And another comical aspect of this thing... Um, uh, tell me if it feels like these books came out the same time Captain Planet was around as a TV show, because uh, there's a lot of very forced environmental messages. I feel like each book has at least one. Uh, one of them deals with whaling, one of them deals with deforestation, one of them deals with, uh, I remember in Cloud City, they talked about uh, the extensive fog and pollution uh, going on um, on the planet of Bespin, and it's like, oh my god, they just had to hammer this stuff in there. <laughs> It's just, and it feels like it has nothing to do with Star Wars. It just felt like, ah, we got to put an environmental message in there. Whaling? Whaling in a Star Wars story. Why not? Um, again, it's one of the reasons I think a lot of people hated that subplot in, in The Last Jedi, where we got to free the, the monkey horses. We got to free those things. Why? Don't we have, guys, don't we have a bigger mission? We have to get the fuel to the ship? Or, or no, we got to get the, uh, the friggin', um, uh, the hacker guy, so he can go on board the, the evil ship and shut down the things so we can get away. It's like, why, why are we dealing with monkey horses? What's going on here, guys? But <laughs> And I like The Last Jedi, but there are aspects to it. There's, some of the criticisms were valid, I'll say that. But um, Yeah, so, you know, forced environmental messages, overuse of friggin' acronyms, uh, violent for, uh, you know, stories that are intended to be for young children, a boring protagonist, uh, lame connections to the Emperor and his family, uh, you got three-eyed guys running around, more than one, um, you got the old characters being written horribly, you've got the new villains being written hilariously incompetent, and it's just a mess, it is just, it's like the Benny Hill version of Star Wars, it's like, what the fuck is going on here? Um, it's just it's a madhouse a madhouse but goddamn is it a lot of fun uh these books are quite enjoyable if you're in the mood for crap i highly recommend checking out the jedi prince series they are the room the troll 2 the star crash the space mutiny of star wars books they are absolutely wonderful in the worst possible way um and so yeah i'm gonna give them an f grade just based on their overall quality alone but I also recommend reading them because they are hilarious. And like I said, I found um, uh, PDFs of them online. Uh, just type them into Google. You'll probably be able to find them somewhere. Um, also, go to the Wikipedia pages for these books to see the cover art from Drew Struzan. Uh, like I said, the cover art is excellent and some of the best cover arts he's ever done, <laughs> sadly. And um, yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's the Jedi Prince series. It's hilarious. It's hilarious. I highly recommend checking it out. Um, so yeah, that is all I have to say about the Jedi Prince series. I think I've talked enough about it. But uh, like I said, I'm going to have more videos lined up for you guys. I'm going to have more Star Wars reviews lined up for you over the next couple of months. But that is all I have for you right now. So you all enjoy the rest of your weekend, and I'll see you all later.